it over to David. Welcome, David. Thank you. Hey, it's good to see so many faces and names that are familiar. It's a little scary, actually. This is like really inside baseball. The bar is very high. So I, I apologize for anything I say. I don't know anything. You're all experts. I'm just a person with an opinion, um, which may be very wrong, which is okay, but I get to have mine. Um, so I'm just going to go through this. Some of, you know, some of you I've known for a long time, some a little bit, some none at all, but you know, you probably heard me waxing poetically about some aspects of these ideas before. Um, sort of an amalgamation of some presentations I've given over the past year or two with a little bit of look back. So that's what I'm going to show. Um, I'm going to go for like maybe like a 25, 30 minute run and then leave it open to just banter. Cause this whole thing really started with Josh and I at a bar bantering and uh, we were like, let's banter in front of other people. And here we are. So uh, why don't we get to the, the, the other part? Okay. Here we go. I'm going to make it so I don't be distracted by it. Okay, cool. All right. This was a title. You know, when you do titles for these kind of things, you want to make them catchy. You always use a colon. This is just standard stuff. I think this is what I'll be talking about. It's probably going to be a little bit broader and different than this, but it's a, it's it's it was the intention to really think about screens and immersiveness and blah, 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 and, and how maybe we have to think about these ideas and what we're doing in experience design in a relationship to what's fun and creative and beautiful and what people want, but also in terms of sort of sustainability and new forms of design. So that's what that was supposed to be in that title. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, I only put this on there because it came out like it was published like four days ago. So I was like, oh, you know, it's kismet. Somebody's publishing this stuff. So this came out and it's nice that a nice, nice little pithy read about, you know, immersive. It uses the sphere as a header image for no other reason. But, you know, I think it begs an interesting question that I'm sure everyone on this call has some sort of thought about. And I know many of you on this call actually participated in this particular project and some of the projects referenced in the article. But um. I don't know. There's just like interesting stuff in that article that I wanted to just throw out there as an interesting idea. Like there's so much talk about immersiveness and experiences being communal. Why does everyone in the photographs only show one person just staring up at the wall? Have you like, this is a thing. Everyone went, oh, and it's so communal. It's like amazing. We come together on this like beautiful artwork. And then it's like one lonely person. Now, as practitioners, we know it's because you shoot the case study at like two in the morning. And so that you can only get like one actor to show up. But really it's kind of strange. Like it actually makes me wonder, like are these experiences actually communal or are they actually kind of not communal? And um, I don't know, I wanna talk about that a little bit. Uh, the other thing is um, this woman quoted in the article, Lizzie, who was involved in this sphere, I know, you know, brings up a really good point like this word immersive is thrown around like so bad and it's it's just so frustrating and I can't tell you how many briefs we've gotten about immersive and no one even knows what it means and they think they know what it means but it, no one knows what it means and I actually don't want to talk about that at all because that's a black hole what I thought was funny though is in the article it pulls a sizzle from the sphere in the U2 concert as if the sphere is not immersive enough they have to fly a drone through the space to find angles and perspectives to make it even more immersive and insane than just being able to sit in your seat and like see something in, in virtual 360. I thought that's got to be indicative of the problem with the word immersive. And, and is it ever enough? You know, is it just enough to, to be there with your point of view and your perspective and where you're sitting and all this amazing uh, sensory overload. I think, I don't know, maybe I'm just pointing out something that's crazy, but it is crazy. Um, so kind of what I'm talking about is if this idea of immersion is in question, or maybe it's not in question, but it's at a sort of peaking point or it's jumping the shark, or maybe there's 
incrementally less immersion to squeeze out of an experience now. You know, there's only so much more resolution you can squeeze out, so much more scale you can reasonably build. If that's even something that's hypothetically true, you can argue it, it might not be true, but I'm saying maybe it's true. If immersion is in question, then what might be next? And um, what I kind of want to talk about a little bit is we sort of came to this epiphany like some years ago, like uh, I would say four or five, six years ago. And it wasn't some, it wasn't because of some like uh, genius uh, discovery or something. It was just kind of like listening and seeing what's in the airwaves and seeing what our clients were demanding of us and seeing what kind of our team wanted to be a part of. And so we sort of had a epiphany that was drawn out over three or four or five years. I guess epiphanies are supposed to strike you like lightning, but it was a long epiphany. And then with that kind of idea, like, what are we trying to do about it? Where are we going? I think that's the tone of the conversation. So it's like uh, the talk is about this paradox of seeking immersion. And if you feel the same paradox, how might you escape? And what else might you do with your experiential design careers or projects and things like that? So really, it's a look back at our past, um, where we are now and kind of where we want to go. So big letters, hush. Uh, seeing all the faces and the names pop on, uh, many have worked with us, have worked alongside us, we've worked for, um, but I'm sure there's people that don't know us at all. So here we go. That's Hush. Uh, we're based here in New York. We got projects going on all around the world, which is fun. Um, we're small but mighty and it's exhausting, but everyone knows that already because for some reason, experience design is absolutely exhausting all the time. It's never easy. Um, this is us on a good day, maybe a good day before the pandemic when everyone forgot that coming to work in the studio was fun and smart and that's how you get promoted. Um, we give spaces a voice. That means we get to work with folks who maybe command more structure and scale and build like great architecture firms and engineering firms. But uh, within those spaces, we get to kind of give a voice to the spaces and help them talk to the people that inhabit that, those spaces. And hopefully we're talking about the things that are most important in the world. Meaning I'm personally as a business owner and a creative, much less interested in talking about a product feature than I am about what the heck your organization is here on the planet to do and why. So I'd rather take on those big ideas uh, than the small ones. Um, and we have a bunch of values that have come out of the work over time. No one sat down and scribbled these values on the, on the wall and were like, this is what we're building the company around. I think this was a natural process of seeing what we constantly return to kind of over and over and over. And when we had as much autonomy in projects as we as we could, what we did innately. And so they're like, be bold, simple, and direct. It's a minimalist philosophy. Don't do more. People want 10 things, let's do three. People want three things, let's do one. I've almost never had a, an example where doing more created more. Um, I think I, I just believe that, 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 that fully. Um, as much as we can with our knowledge, you know, really think about people wholly, holistically, uh and and really think about how each of those pieces works together i think we have a long way to go actually compared to some of you to really be able to tune that and live up to this statement but i think it's a value um i think uh information is everywhere but giving it a beauty and a way and aesthetic and a sensibility is is top of mind um this one's big and actually probably the thesis behind the whole the whole presentation which is if you're gonna do something, let's try to make it last. And I think as I got older, as a person, I just kind of didn't care about stuff that was a flash in the pan anymore. And I wanted to put my time and effort and thought into things that mattered more, not necessarily altruistically, but just mattered more for longer. Uh, ideas that would get out of the sine wave of, marketing and the sine wave of the fickleness of preference and got up into the stratosphere things that we can all remind ourselves of every day that that matter and it'll be true in 10 years or 50 years 
Uh, and then lastly, you know, we've had a, a, an evolving technology practice. Some folks on the call have been part of that technology practice with us, I think, but constantly being reductive around our technology practice where we're not doing anything because it's cool and new and interesting only. We're only doing it if it actually makes sense. So it's more like a strategic look at, at technology. So lastly, it's designed everything to evolve. I mean, that's a no-brainer if you're doing something digital, but when we do it well, it seems to be a flywheel for us. Okay, so what we're really talking about is the spaces between architecture and technology, uh, materials and light, um, space and the information that can be presented in those spaces. And of course, like engineering of, of spaces and buildings and the software that, that exists inside and the way buildings and people connect. And so I think a lot of our work at the end of the day is buildings is a, is a shorthand, but like the built environment and the people in, inside. And, and that's kind of just like maybe the through line between everything we do. And the idea that architecture, even before modern experience design or creative technology, was the first source of affecting people. I mean, it was uh, an, uh, Maslow's hierarchy, it was shelter, but it soon became all the things that are at the top of the pyramid, uh, really trying to connect you with the highest order of what it means to be a human. So I think in some ways we're trying to create the voice for these built environments that people really understand and, and think about more deeply. So I'm gonna show you a few projects today, maybe um, one that started a while ago, one that built on that, one we did for Venice and, and a new one that we're working on that's kind of whip. Um, but why did we start doing this stuff? you kind of start changing your practice a little bit for a million reasons, you know, economic interest, age, trend, you know, all those things are important, but I think something happened with us. You know, if you, you don't know our work, this is our work. If you do know our work, you've seen this work. Um, I think it's sort of, sort of immersive, or I, although I never use that word, um, artful, integrated, I don't know, high design. I, I This is what I hope you would say it is. Um, but but certainly like technologically uh, related and things like that. So um, even farther back than that stuff, you know, we were doing all sorts of fun stuff. Some people on this call were involved in an incredible Nike project back in the day. It is like, you know, it was the stuff, you know, shove people in dark spaces blow their hair back with light and sound and material and vibration and interaction and maybe make them run really fast on a treadmill or, you know, this was so fun. I mean, we had some of the best times. I love this stuff. We, we it was really great. It still is great. Um, but it's very unique, you know, it's, it's its own thing. Um, and then we sort of like moved a little bit, I wouldn't say forward, but you know, we, it started to become a little bit more uh, precise and strategic and less about the shock and awe, I'd say. It like slowed down. Um, it slowed down because it stretched time and it kind of became less about that like moment and it was more about, I guess, that enduring principle I showed you uh, earlier. Um, but what was interesting, what we kind of realized was that what clients were starting to want from us was starting to be in conflict with what they say they wanted out in the world and what we wanted in the world for ourselves. And that conflict started to show up more and more and more. And, it, and this talk is a little bit more about sustainability, but it, the conflict showed up in a couple of ways. So I just wanted to kind of set it up like the conflict showed up in going from these immersive, really sort of like dense, immersive moments kind of work to stuff that I would call uh, more open, more accessible, more livable, longer, enduring, more balanced. And why was that happening? Well, only a certain set of clients want to shove their customers in a dark box and blow their hair back. 
like a very specific audience uh, need and desire. And once you leave that like top 5% of brands and organizations who want that for a very particular audience, um, no one wants that. So, you know, before things in the workplace or real estate was like a taboo because of the pandemic, no one wanted that for their workplace. So all of a sudden, like thousands and thousands of people, employees and guests and things like that who could be activated in workplace or commercial real estate or transportation halls or airports or, you know, all this like people and space where you could really move people, inspire people. It was all off the table for us because that doesn't belong there. So it was this like fit where you're just like, man, this isn't applicable. And so that was, that was half. And then the other half was, we just looked at it a lot and we're like, man, like as our sustainability desires and knowledge around design started to improve and increase, we, we were like, this stuff feels bad. Other stuff feels good. And honestly, uh, some decisions at businesses are made with that limited information and that much of a gut and intuition. And that's just reality. But it was client demand for this is 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 interesting and has a lot of potential. So that shift happened. And then on the sustainability side, we kept hearing from clients, whether they were cultural institutions or household B2C brands or big real estate firms or whatever, you know, what's what's on their marketing airwaves, what's on their ESG reports, what's in their uh, shareholder uh, uh, reports. It's all about sustainability and all about their commitments and all about a finite time to be able to achieve these commitments. And so that became pretty hard to stomach when one of those brands would say this out in the world and commit, but then turn around and ask us to do something that is so clearly unsustainable for a million reasons, whether that's an event that happens in a day and throws away literally every piece of material that they use to build it. Um, it just like does not compute. And and it's not that that's uncommon, right? That that the marketing engine and the PR engine and the voice engine of a big organization has has goals to set, but the operational piece of the business behind that has to catch up. And um, and that we knew there was always going to be a delta that there, and that's fine. But we knew over time that delta would 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 shrink, and so at some point this was going to be hard to to equate. So. You know, some of you on this call have worked on some of these projects. So this isn't a bashing about the projects. This is really just saying like big digital. I don't care how you skin it. I don't care if it's powered by green energy. The shit's not good. Tons of embodied carbon comes on a ship from China. Plastics that will be in our environment for centuries. And forget about energy use. So... Do I think this stuff is beautiful? Yeah, I mean, sure. And, I, and 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 is it have a lot of possible revenue and artistry? And yes, 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 yes. It's not about that. It's just about this truth. So we couldn't unsee this paradox. And we, we kind of had to start changing the firm at some level. Yet we still kept doing this stuff and still do the kind of work. But we had to start to change a little bit because we just thought about that energy use. You all know the... You all know the drills and the stats around around uh, carbon and and massive processing power and and it's just crazy. And y'all know what happens to all of those low res LED boards that were so cool five years ago. Um, you know, it's just true, right? I don't think it's it's um it's it's really arguable. So I don't know. We got a little more planet centric over the last four or five years. And this isn't necessarily about altruism. It's just kind of about like, this is like the right way, the right things to be thinking about. Um, but we had to kind of match our vision of what we think is good for the world and what we want to stand behind with like how we operationalize that, right? Because that's the hard part.
it's like you can want to do this stuff, but then you got to figure out how. So what I'm about to start to tell you is like, how do we start this change? And the answer is simple. Like we rode on the coattails of a great client. That's it. I don't know if without this client, we would have been able to start uh, the process as fast or maybe have been as aggressive in trying to, to turn a little bit. So once we got momentum, then we started to get really proactive with it. So this client is a client you probably never heard of, but it's a biotech company at a Silver Spring, Maryland, amazing leadership. Um, they save lives with their amazing biotech innovations. Um, and we learned through a project with a net zero building uh, called the Unisphere. It's got all sorts of these crazy uh, engineering systems inside from solar to geothermal to sensor systems to whatever. And we had to learn all about what this stuff was. How does a building achieve site net zero? Uh, and what does that require technically, materially? Um, how do you calculate it? Uh, how do you make sense of it? And so we were asked to just make this building into uh, give this building a voice. If you go back to our mission and tell everyone in this building about the speed of construction and engineering and design and why everyone in the world should be building like this. And so we looked at it through social, motivational, educational ways and social. We wanted to create something that would galvanize everyone around this idea that if we're going to build anything on this planet, it should use no more energy than it creates. And so the atrium became the centerpiece. And so we looked at um, this connection to the sun and the rhythms of, of the world and the seasons and energy in general and historical and present means of looking at that and some basic true forevers uh, around the way we relate to the sun, which is the only thing that powers our our, our planet and gives us all energy and life. And then we turned that into some simple diagrams because simple is always better. And it's not always about the, mess, the best animation. It's about what conveys it to the client. So how do we create this idea of cyclical and repetition and balance and convey that to the client about this is how we want people to connect with this idea of net zero energy and how energy ebbs and flows. But if we can control it, we can make the planet better. And so these simple diagrams really led us to a feature piece that was a sculpture. And what's cool is we got here and we got here through simplicity. If you look at this materially, it's almost nothing, right? There's almost nothing there, but visually it's quite something. It's like 40, 50 feet in diameter because of the light, but materially it's, it's, it's negligible. There's not much there. So we, I'll get back to that. So we, we structured and built this light sculpture made out of stainless steel fins and then really basic low energy lighting that projects outwards or inwards and dims. And because we can sequence it, we can change the, the meaning of what it's saying. But in all of its forms, it's telling you if the building's producing more energy than it's using or using more energy than it's producing. And then there's some interesting Easter eggs about solar noon and all this other stuff. But I'll get back to that. The motivational part was, you know, giving people kind of gamified understanding of energy and, and this idea that energy is flowing through the, the walls of the building. And so uh, can we expose that in interesting ways? This is just like concept art. But ultimately it became this long sort of interface that is pretty simple. It's kind of like a dashboard. And then the third one is education. And we just, we just turned the whole thing into a museum, you know, with environmental graphics and teaching everyone what the heck it means to be a solar panel and what's a PV cell and how does it work? And, you know, these are people that might not know the whole story on day one, but man, over the tenure of working at a company for three years, five years, seven years, you're going to know it back and forth by the time you go to the bathroom enough times or go to the meeting on that floor seven or eight times or whatever. So this is about <clears throat> repetition. And so the system together is a good system. It combines these three pieces and, and helps really convey this idea of sustainable energy. So the final space is, is kind of, the building's crazy. It's like an engineered building by Ewing Cole. It's very much like being inside a motor. 
<clears throat> but inside the inside of the motor is this like piece that I think does what we want to do, which is it, it doesn't distract. I don't know if it immerses people, but it certainly reminds people of their connection to their sustainability commitment, the organization's commitment, and that humans and built environment are connected inextricably to achieving certain sustainability goals. And everyone can play their part just a little bit. Everyone can turn off a light switch when they leave. Everyone can put on a sweater instead of turning up the heat. These little actions tend to stack up over days and months and years. And so that's what that does. So that's the system. And we learned that energy limitations for creativity. And this is what I love. This was the most creative thing we, we, we did. I'm kind of being facetious, but why did that thing, that light sculpture turn out to be a light sculpture with low res light that just turns on and off and rotates and not some big LED wall? Spreadsheet. A big LED wall would have crushed the energy budget of that building. And mathematically, we wouldn't have been allowed to create it because it would have used more energy than was than was able to be created by the solar panels of the building. So the ideas were, were forcibly restrained by the energy budget and limitations. And so that's why it ended up being that sculpture. And that was our big breakthrough to really understand the power of this limitation and how we can use it for interesting new not expected types of experience designs. We got to work more with these guys and gals. Uh, the next project was a mass timber building next door. If you know anything about mass timber, it's net zero, but also carbon zero. So meaning uh, uh, basically, how do we understand what timber does for a carbon calculation of a building? And how do we take that into account as well as what we, everything we learned about net zero energy? So we know that trees sequester carbon, the only material that does that. So you build a building out of trees, you can actually start with a deficit uh, uh, of, car or, sorry, a surplus. And therefore uh, the building actually works off that for its lifetime. So we looked at carbon and the way materials work in a bunch of ways. We looked at materials and time, these big forms that tell stories through making the material more visible and more tactical to people. So you actually inhabit a building, but you're actually close to the idea of timber and it, and light produces the storytelling medium on which we can talk about what's happening with the carbon calculations of the building. So these are just some additional tests and ideas in progress, marking the time and evolution of a building. And again, elements that we designed that actually would change over time. So we could look at quarter over quarter, how the building's performing on its carbon calculation and the building would actually change and the spaces would actually change and be adjusted to reflect that. And so these are ongoing. But simple ways to use material, some robotics, and some light all, all optimizing that storytelling. This idea of baking out the performance of the building from a carbon standpoint, quarter over quarter or year over year, knowing that it's not a straight line, but that it's all in pursuit of the progress towards carbon zero. And then lastly, this idea of material and carbon being a unit-based proposition. The unit of timber and its relationship to carbon costs is much different than the unit of steel. So understanding what the core unit building block of timber is and its relationship to carbon lets you do all sorts of things. So we realize there's a sort of information graphics, data visualization play that actually uses like unit elements of sculptural form. So you could look at almost anything in the building and understand the carbon cost of producing that design element. It got to be very granular, but we thought we could create a whole topology in which you could read the entire building and understand each material and its cost to be to, to in its use of creation. So we learned that even more than net zero energy, carbon and accounting for carbon is, is actually even more complex because it brings in a much more complex temporal element um, as it relates to timber. 
but that was a, a major learning. But it wasn't enough to explore one type of building material in our design. So we started to move towards a much more holistic thinking about materiality and its use. And so we engaged a project for the Venice Biennale uh, this last year in which we wanted to expand our knowledge beyond timber and into multiple material sources. So we went from net zero to carbon cost of timber to much broader materials cost knowledge. And I love this little graph that someone posted on Slack. And you're like, oh, cool, timber is great. It's the only uh, uh, sequestered carbon material. And there's differences between materials. But when you start to look at it compared to other materials, you realize how offensive other materials are in the palette as designers that we can incorporate. So, you know, architects know this up and down. They, they know about concrete and, and buildings and and there's all sorts of interesting things about reuse for those things. But to see it in a graph form, you realize, wow, I don't know this about my built environment. And we're practitioners, right? We walk around all day and we actually don't know uh, as much as we should about all these different inputs. So we thought an interesting like provocation artistically would be, um, you know, if this is a random object made out of wood, for example, I don't know anything about it other than it's cylindrical and looks reasonably nice. Um, wouldn't it be interesting if that object actually started to obtain formal qualities that indicated the cost of its production carbon wise? So what if it actually could change its form and that form would reveal the carbon cost of its creation and different materials would have different formal qualities because they would be better or worse for the the environment in terms of their carbon impact. That was the provocation. So we started going around this idea of material stories and it's a sort of broad ongoing proposition that we're working in, on in many different forms. But it started with this project for Venice um, and we started doing a lot of tests and looking at different materials and just playing and how they could rec be represented to be different but the same and through similar objects but made with different materials we could accentuate that difference and that carbon cost that's mostly hidden to folks like us. And, you know, there's a million ways to do it. At the end of the day, we then brought that into thinking through data because, you know, this is the moment where data and information about materials is, is, is skyrocketing and that data is becoming more openly accessible. So it's kind of like uh, the financial markets, you know, in let's say 1997, on the internet, you know, existed, but hard to access and imperfect. That data is now, you know, perfect in real time. So we know this is the trend with material data. So we basically created some simple software that allowed us to pull in the carbon cost of any material in this database. And it would parametrically be able to alter an object into infinite forms, but all those forms would be indicative of the carbon cost of that material, right? So it would always be uh, removed uh, an amount of material that indicated uh, that material's carbon cost. So it got pretty simple from there. We'd make all these sculptures where each element would display its cost and its form. And we could, we could add these together in a million different ways. And that became the project. So just really understanding cool ways to deform materials through carbon data and then stack everything, no pun intended, in, in cool ways. So we we did this. We we made 144 uh, little digital sculptures in Venice that we're producing now in real material form. But you all know what this is, this idea is. It's really just a provocation because the provocation isn't about whether these forms are are the most beautiful objects in the world or not. It actually really is asking ourselves why do objects like this have no story to tell. And even a coffee cup could tell its story about the clay made, you know, the, the process of, 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 of clay and its cost, a bench or a facade or a million other things we see in our environments. It's, so at some point, if you take this up a notch, our built environment could just be way more expressive of its materials and their positive or negative value in the world. So that that's kind of where we're headed and, and pulling on. All the while, we increase our material understanding and research exponentially to then apply that to work in progress 
in real time where every decision we're making is more responsible around how we're injecting materials. So materials knowledge is critical if we're gonna be more sustainable in our experiential design. And the, the last thing I'll show you is kind of a little just snag from a deck, you know, in the last three weeks, but um, more about materials is also about reuse or just use less of them to start. That's a great way to be more sustainable, just use less. So we're working on another project with the same client, really thinking about a site and a building in which we add nothing, but we express a lot. What a cool proposition. We come in as an experience design firm and we add nothing. If anything, we take it away. So we 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 kind of had this mental explosion where we were like, wait, we could tell all these stories by removal, not addition. Imagine everything. Imagine typography, environmental graphics, um, sculptural forms by actually removing and changing and reconstituting rather than adding. So that was it. So we really was like, add only what's necessary and then bring together the organic and, and organic. And the one piece I really like is we we're doing a sundial. Sundial is so cool. We could utilize the landscape. There's so much material on a construction site from demolition of other building structures and moving earth around. We can siphon a little bit of that up and reconstitute into something that actually has incredible storytelling power, is accurate informationally, like it's a sundial. And experientially, it can invite a sort of communal contemplation, right? It's a place where people can really understand their relationship to time and each other and their purpose. And so these are just fun, fun studies. Everything you see here is not anything brought in from the outside. It's all reconstituted and reused. You know, it's just like so fun, so cool. It's like my favorite thing. I'll, I'll build this in our backyard if, if we don't end up building it. I don't even care. Um, this one is like a perfect example, right? All this is reused timber from site. All the stuff in these gabion cages is material from site. Just put in uh, the gabion cages that are there. Already existed. We're just giving it form. So... I don't know. I'm psyched about this stuff. Um, what did we learn? Reuse is a better design story because you can build anything out of anything. So might as well build it and then also have that story of how did you build it? It, it just adds so much more legitimacy and value to the bigger picture of what this organization is trying to do. But I would say it'd be hard for you to tell me an organization that doesn't want to tell a story like this, whether you're Nike or United Therapeutics. Um, so that's kind of the, the three parts. Um, I know we have 15 minutes left and I want to talk. So I'm just going to bang through this stuff. We have some propositions. We think more creative. We're going from a world filled with screens. That's where the topic of this came from, screen fatigue. I I mean, I, I still fetishize some of the stuff. I don't want you to think any different, but I think we're basically moving from a, a world full of screens and things, which I have no longing for at all, personally, to a world that's you know more more balanced. And ultimately, you know, if we do the best projects of our firm, they will, they will be done with sustainable design practices, and they will tell the stories around sustainability for these organizations. So it's like a two for one. So some things to talk about with Josh and you all with your very vocalness is, you know, is immersive about doing more or actually doing less. I bet you we could all come up with versions of a less immersive space that we've all been to. Is immersive about the senses, like immersing our five senses in maximalness, or is it about ideas? I don't know. I'm sort of infatuated with being immersed in big ideas to think about, not necessarily loud things. And then, you know, is there a way out? is immersive at odds with sustainability or is there a way to be immersive and sustainable? I think that's a question we all need to be asking ourselves. That's it. Let's talk. All right. Thank you, David. That was amazing. I love it. Um, I have so many uh, questions, thoughts, um, but if anybody wants to throw their questions in the chat, we can, we can start there. All right. Let's see. 
Uh, Jisook, do you want to ask the, ask the question or you want me to do that for you? Hello. Hi, I can ask. Hi, I'm Jisook. And actually, my team is working on a new um, headquarters office for our new office space. And a lot of feedback that I've been getting every time my team proposes something that's more simple or has more of these data visualization aspects, the feedback we get from um, internal stakeholders and executive leadership is, well, we just want something big and bold, or we just want something that's just like a wow moment because clients aren't going to get the more like artistic stuff. So how do you kind of create um, or get buy-in for these internal stakeholders to think more about like big and bold isn't the answer to an amazing experience? Uh, Josh, how do you do this? Do we, do just we... talk, man. Just talk. You okay, good? Cool. Uh, yeah, great question. Um, I I think big and bold is great. I love big and bold. Um, I think it's you can do big and bold in you know in incredibly artistic ways. You can do big and bold in incredibly informational ways. So I don't know if the tension you've set for yourself is like an actual real tension. It it might be another axis. So I think the 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 way we do it, and um, I think it's smart to think about. Right? Is it? It's there's not a one size fits all. So as an experienced designer, as a design firm, you kind of have to think on all those levels and it's less about either or, and it's more about the right thing at the right size for the right people in the right space. And, and then, you know, you, you're ultimately in charge of bringing them a palette of ideas that aren't all ginormous and artistic, but they answer all the pieces of the puzzle. Now, every organization has a different threshold and tolerance for all those pieces, but if you think about it more like a, a suite of interconnected things, you don't have to put all your your money on on the one one thing to solve everyone's uh, storytelling challenges, which is which I agree is impossible. Is that, well, a, is that a good start? I like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was actually um, I, I just make a, a loop back to one of these previous uh, future space talks we did with the Museum of Ice Cream. And one of the things that they, they were doing, which I thought was kind of interesting and, you know, can talk about the merits of those guys, but, um, you know, they, they design for, for certain emotions, you know, and they're like, they, they like, they want this to feel like they want a space to feel happy, you know? And I feel like, you know, when people are trying to do something that's like immersive, a lot of times they're like trying to figure out like, what is that emotional quality that we're going for? And it's like, well, you drop a giant Rafik Anadol, like maybe that's all, but like, that's not the only way to get to all. Like, I mean, I think a lot of the, the work, you know, David, you were showing with these like giant sculptural and light forms can create all, oh. But it's a different kind of vibe than a Rafik, you know, and and like maybe and I and I think maybe a more contemporary approach. I don't know. That was the question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Maggie had a question. You want to, or David? Do you want to jump on there? Or uh, Maggie? Maggie had a question. Uh, do you want to jump on and ask? Hi, I was looking for my mute button. Sure. Yeah, I was um wondering about um how you know you mentioned accessibility in the space and how clients are kind of driving that and I was wondering if you know once you finish a project if clients are now wanting some control over the digital content um or some kind of like templatized way to extend the content that you guys have provided um which would then change the nature of your message yeah I mean uh, certainly part of our, our remit is to hand over the keys a little bit, but be there for strategic initiatives and changes, right? We, we have almost no ability to operationalize like a minute to minute sort of information change, but, uh, big steering changes we want to make sure that we're a part of. So there's a technical answer to your question, right? Which is like, sure. Do we give them the ability and software and ability to change stuff on their own? And the answer is sure. Of course, it's theirs. They own it. Um, what I would, what I think we're trying to do, and I, I'm, I'm more excited about this is, is working on things that, like I said in the beginning of the presentation, are are more enduring, because they take on higher order ideas, and for a business, those higher order ideas don't change in a marketing cycle or a quarterly cadence, or because they launched a new product. They're kind of why we exist in the world. And in that way, you sort of get yourself out of 
this cadence of like content updates or steering and you get out of the the marketing storytelling piece and you 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 kind of get to this like north star expression and uh back to the previous question sometimes that can't stand alone because it's kind of a one liner and it it's bold and it doesn't have all that sub level understanding that might need to be conveyed but you know if you could just if we could have our way that's probably what it would be yeah I don't know if that helped Maggie, but it does, yeah. And where you're the direction of where you're going now with projects, it's becoming less of a issue. You can't really templatize light. <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna put that on a t-shirt. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Hey dude, I'm actually gonna I, I want to switch what uh stick one of my own questions in here. Um, how how has your team evolved, you know, over the over the you know the course of these years? I mean, you know, we've you know, when you run an agency, you have these people that are like trained to do, you know, like crazy experiences with Cinder and open frameworks. And then you got, you got them trained on uh, Unreal and Unity. And now you're got them doing programmatic parametric architecture. Are these the same people or, or is the team composition has changed? Like how, how, how's the crew gone along for the ride? Yeah. I mean, teams changed a lot. Um, you might imagine it's changed a lot for reasons of strategic initiative with the business, but also if you have been a alive in the last four years, uh, slightly changing uh, environments, business models, uh, life uh, goals, locations, et cetera. So I think you add the world out there and what kind of thrash it causes, plus the world in here in terms of like what we're trying to do, it, it moves around a little bit. But what's interesting is the most valuable thing we've ever created with Hush is beyond any project or any particular team. It's like the network, which is pretty awesome to see a lot of that network on this on this Zoom. It's like, I feel so empowered and just like grateful that, you know, we got to spend a week or years with people that are so smart. So in a way, maybe what happens, I would put a position it this way, Josh, what happens in house day one, a contract is signed is much different than it was five or 10 years ago. But what happens over the course of a project, a lifetime, taps into all these relationships and skills and expertise that we've we've amassed. I mean, it's it's back to the same amazing people, maybe just at a different moment, you know. All right, and then uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, Justin, you had a question. Do you want to uh, ask it, or should I? Not Justin Cohn. Uh, Justin. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't have a question. I was just. Uh... Oh, no, no, Justin, it wasn't you. There was another Justin, but good okay, to see you. Okay, I was going to say, that wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about, yeah, uh, Justin uh, Kaleski. Uh, Hello. Uh, Justin Cohn, good to see you, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. I, so I don't necessarily work in the you know physical space. I work in the digital space instead. So I'm very curious of how could I potentially build sustainability restrictions on digital product uh, products, so that way I can take those to my clients and be like, okay, we can give you innovative solutions, but we want to ensure that we are sustainable for the future, especially when they're asking for very power hungry AI powered solutions like their own ChatGPT integration. It's a great question. Um, I can tell you a little bit what we're doing, but I, I'm definitely not an expert here. So, for example, in the digital parts of our business, right, we're trying to work with the best partners out there who are already demonstrating expertise and knowledge and research into this. So if we're thinking about hardware systems, we're talking about folks who are helping us define and spec hardware solutions that are um optimized, right? They're not just the biggest and the best and the latest, because that's what they got to sell. It's optimized for the right fit of this project. So minimizing en energy, maximizing impact, for example. So there's a whole piece of that in terms of servers and, you know, sources of energy and um, where that's coming from, which actually is a piece that we need to build out more. But it's it's for us, it's going to come through not developing our own knowledge in, in house, but working with other folks that are that are way smarter than us. So I think, I don't know, someone else lean in here, because I think there's probably that knowledge on this call. I actually know that there, there's a there's a there's a whole thread on the Blue Cadet Slack about this, um, about sort of like the software side. Uh, Justin, shoot me an email. And I'll 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 send you I'll send you I'll send you some links, and and then maybe that's a good topic for a future future spaces as well. Um, all right, I think maybe we have time for one more question. Um, Phil, did you want to ask your question? 
Sure. Just a quick question. Um, so as you implement your design ideas, um, what about ongoing maintenance for the building? Do the buildings come with a user's guide to uh, to uh, basically help the staff maintain this over the decades? Absolutely. I mean, you can imagine the the uh, the complexity we often add to what seems like a beautiful integrated waterfall construction and build timeline. Like we come in and you got to have bullish clients who understand the value and and why and then we do a lot of integration so there's a long runway right to land the plane on with bringing all the functions together in a permanent built environment space so they understand operational requirements uh support mechanisms and replaceability and th these kind of things so the good news is you know, this isn't something we throw together at the end. We're really understanding what the operational ecosystem is and figuring out who's going to play what part of the puzzle ongoing for, in quotes, forever. So it's uh, it's 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 actually like one of the least scary parts of what we do because, you know, it's really about organizational, uh, uh, organizing stakeholders and just making sure everyone understands what piece they're going to do. Thank you. Okay, let's see. I, I, we have we have one minute. You know what? I think we're done, man. This was great, <laughs> David. Thank you so much for joining us, man. I I always love you know these conversations. This is an amazing presentation. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining. Actually, you know what, David? One of the things I've been doing um recently, which is good, just like if there's any sort of parting words for this community, like you know what you want to see people doing, if you want to plug anything else that you're doing, you know, take 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 the last minute to do it. Um, no, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of strangely as like a lead sales and brand person for the company, I, I'm strangely, uh, embarrassed among peers. You know, I think, uh, I don't know, we're all in this together. It's a hard business. It's complex. Market forces are complex. I just think, uh, we owe it to ourselves to do something unique and that we're passionate about and, uh, and, uh, you know, everything that's good that's happened in our business and to me personally in, in my career has been because of sharing ideas and knowledge and not being, you know, not being a, a dick about it. So I, I really love these kind of forums and I love the opportunity to share and learn. So I think we keep doing that and hold ourselves to a higher standard because there's a lot of crap out there. So let's keep putting things in the world that are good and better. Yeah. I love it, man. And I would second that. I mean, I would say that, you know, Back in the day when we were competing against Hush, you'd be like, those guys, we're going to beat them. And like, this is a much more safe, safe and sane space to be in, you know, it's like, and honestly, it's a, it's a fantastic community. I think what you'll find is that particularly among these peers, there's a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of similarity and a lot, of, a, lot a lot that can be kind of joined, you know, gained in this community. So thanks for joining, man. It was great to see you. We'll uh, hopefully grab a drink or a meal sometime soon. Absolutely. Um, and then, everyone. all right. Awesome. Thanks everybody. We'll hope to uh, catch you again soon. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.